Hi, um, my name is Olive Power. I'm a Kubernetes architect at VMware, and today we're going to talk about uh, operators, a rough guide to Kubernetes operators. Uh, so we're going to keep the agenda pretty simple, the what, why, how, and what next in and around uh, Kubernetes operators. So first we're just going to do a little background just to set the context. So as you probably all know, but we're just going to go over it again, Kubernetes is a platform for managing containerized applications. And all the information about the platform is stored in a distributed uh, key store called etcd. So all the information about the cluster that is relevant to the cluster is stored in there. So it's the memory of the cluster, if you like. And the interaction uh, with Kubernetes, is it's all API driven. And you can interact with that API through a module called kubectl, or kube control, depending on how you want to pronounce it. So you can form commands like you know, get, or create, or delete. And I've shown a few examples there. But it's just important to remember that it's API driven, and you can interact with it through kubectl. And the final point that I'm going to sort of raise about in terms of background is that it maintains a desired state. Now, this is a very important concept of Kubernetes, and it's kind of how, how the whole thing rolls, really. It, if you, it's a declarative system where you tell it how you want your system to look like, and Kubernetes will maintain that. So it's all the time trying to converge on the desired state that you want it to be. So when we talk about Kubernetes and we simplify that statement a bit, you say to it, I want my application A, or in Kubernetes speak, a pod, to run X number of times, let's say. So this is a simple sort of a declaration that you've made as a user. And you want Kubernetes to keep checking that it makes sure it stays that way. So that X amount of uh, instances of your application. And you want Kubernetes to reconcile it or remediate it or fix it when it's not, when it falls away from that whether it falls away because something gets broken, so breaks one of your instances, or indeed if somebody tries to add an additional one, it will put it back to your desired state, let's say x equals five, so we'll always maintain it at five instances of your application. And so it's all the time doing a, what we call a reconciliation loop, so you, you tell it what you want it to look like, Kubernetes will check it for you, and it will fix it if it's not at the desired state you want, and it will keep looping through that all the time. And the functionality within Kubernetes that does that are called controllers. So controllers are a software loop that basically monitors your resource of interest. In our case, in this example, is the number of pods. And it's all the time comparing that desired state to the actual state and taking remedial action. Oh, sorry, that's dropped off the bottom there. So it's continuously looping, looping in Kubernetes all the time, as I say, trying to, trying to converge on the desired state of, the, of the, what you've said to Kubernetes that you want it to be. So I talked about objects of interest, and in our example, we're talking about pods, so the number of pods we wanted to be five. Um, and that's an inbuilt resource. And Kubernetes has got a lot of inbuilt resources. And it's got a lot of controllers that are inbuilt that monitor those resources to make sure they're at desired state. But the thing is, Kubernetes is extensible. And this is a really good thing, because this means you can add your own resources, stuff that doesn't come out of the box. Because like, Kubernetes doesn't know anything about your own custom application, for example. So how are you going to get your application into Kubernetes and get Kubernetes to manage that external application the same way it manages its own internal resources? Um, and that's the concept of custom resource. You can create custom resources in Kubernetes, your own custom resources that has custom attributes that to describe that resource. For example, Olive. Olive might be a resource that you're interested in. It might be a complex database application called Olive. And it's got various attributes like color, users, location, something like that. Um, and once you add these as a custom resource and define what that custom is in terms of attributes called custom resource definitions, so CRDs, it's now part of the Kubernetes API, and you can interact and query with that uh, custom resource through the API, again, through kubectl. So you can now go kubectl, get all of color, because you have extended the UP API to include your new resource and the new attributes related to that resource. So this means that this leads us onto like what an operator is. So an operator are a class of controller. Remember the controller is the thing that keeps looping around to check whether your resource of interest is at the desired state that you want it to be. Operator um, manages your custom resources and with your own custom reconciliation logic. So remember Kubernetes has got inbuilt resources, inbuilt controllers. 
Operators are the controller that look after your customer resources. So basically it's your code that's reconciling um, your custom application to be the way you want it to be. And it's basically a way for packaging applications for Kubernetes. So when you talk about operators, it's like a way of packaging up your custom, perhaps complicated application in a way that Kubernetes understands. So in terms of custom resources, CRDs, extending the API. So Kubernetes is now talking and remediating your custom application the same way that it's remediating its own inbuilt resources. And so when I say packaging applications for Kubernetes, uh, I really mean that in a way that we have ISVs now who are packaging up their applications and delivering them and making them available as operators. So maybe we've all been, I've kind of come from a Windows background, and I remember we used to always repackage stuff as MSIs or as .exes. There's always, uh, any platform that comes along, there will always be vendors who will make sure that their application is packaged so it works nicely as, and is easily installed on that platform. So, you know, you use software tools like WISE to create MSIs so they would install nicely on Windows. You've got RPMs, package up software, so they install nicely on Windows. Here we have operators, we have software vendors packaging up their applications as operators so that they install nicely on Kubernetes. And indeed, why wouldn't, why wouldn't any software vendor do that? Why wouldn't they package up their stuff so that it can be installed easily on that platform? And perhaps you use their version of the software rather than somebody else's who doesn't play nicely with Kubernetes. So there's a thing called Operator Hub. Go check it out. There's a lot of applications in there packaged up as operators that you can just download, run, and apply, and they will install on Kubernetes. And they are crafted and created in such a way that that application is maintained in the same way that Kubernetes maintains its own resources. So it will check and make sure it's at its desired state. If something changes, like you notice on the bottom right there, there's CockroachDB. So that's a database. Databases always have their own sort of finicky sees when, when you install them. Like if there's three instances of a database and you, and you need to add a fourth one, sometimes you have to do stuff to the other three to maybe stop a service, maybe flush a cache, maybe do something to add the fourth instance into the cluster of the databases. These are all steps that you define to Kubernetes and it will do them for you, basically as code, because they're specific to that application. So now if, if, if Kubernetes sees a change, the CockroachDB in terms of number of instances, for example, the operator has been coded to react and do all the necessary steps that the admin would have had to do manually to make that uh, you know, managed in the way that you want it to be. So why? Why, um, why would you want to do this? Right? Well, you're, as I just said, you're extending Kubernetes to manage custom resources and custom applications in exactly the same way that it manages its own internal resources, which is a very powerful thing. And so you're making it easier to deploy your complex applications on Kubernetes, stuff like database, um, and stuff like that Kubernetes doesn't know anything about. So for example, like ServiceNow, if, if something happens and you want something written to ServiceNow, you can craft an operator, like a ServiceNow operator that watches something in Kubernetes, like maybe uh, an instance of a certain application is spun up, and your operator then will write maybe an entry in ServiceNow, because maybe ServiceNow is your single source of truth for licensing, so you want it to know every time an application is spun up. Spun up. So to deploy that, you know, you'd figure that maybe the ServiceNow folk would, would you know, produce an operator for that. Otherwise, you, you craft the code yourself and package it up as an operator. And how you do that is, most of the operators are written in Go, purely because Go is, is what Kubernetes is written in, and usually it's kind of a nice thing to write your extensions in the same language that the actual thing is written in in the first place. However, there are other languages that you can use, like Java or Ansible, because if you remember, the operator is going to be the application code that's going to do the logic can be in Go, but it's deployed as a pod, right? So it's a, it's a containerized application, so it can actually be in any language you want, really, because it's segregated from the underlying OS, so you can have it in any code you want. Java is obviously quite a popular language, but Go is, is kind of the, is the, is the language that most of those ISVs that I showed you in the previous page, that's the language they're packaging their operators up in. So how do you do this? So a great place to start if you're kind of beginning your operator journey is to have a look at the opera operator framework. So this is an open source project and has many things inside it to help you build your operator. The main one of which is the operator SDK. And that provides the tools to build and test and package your operator. And the URL is, is there. Okay. And um, basically, when you sort of 
fire up the operator SDK and have a look at it. It basically takes you through the five steps to build your operator. So you create a new project for it. You define your custom resources, maybe your, your custom database or your service now. You define like the, the attributes or the custom resource definitions, like how that custom resource looks and what attributes are relevant to it. So that's your custom resource definition. So that's now the extension to the API. So you now have to tell the operator, well, what do I actually want to watch? What, what, what is it in this application that I want to like, detect when it changes, either when it's deleted or added to or um, removed? What do I want to watch? And then what do I want to happen, point four? What's the reconciliation logic that I want to happen when something changes? So again, that's, only, that's, that's what your database administrator or your service now administrator, they're the, they're the steps that those kind of folks know. So that needs to be coded into your operator. And then you build the thing and deploy it into Kubernetes. OK, so uh, there's a couple of resources that I wanted to point out to in a, in a, like a what next scenario. The first thing is uh, there's a great article written by the Core OS guys who originally came up with the term operators, actually. So that's a really great article to have a read to kind of get more of a, a broad view on what operators are. And then the second resource I want you to have a look at is the operator framework slash awesome operators. So basically, uh, if, you, if you fire that up, you, you'll kind of land on this page, which is uh, you know, awesome operators in the wild. So these are, again, open source uh, operators that have been built by various teams, and sometimes the vendor itself, sometimes other people who are just building packages. Um, and it's a great place to start, not only maybe to get the actual operator so you don't have to do it yourself. So for example, if you were looking at Airflow, thinking, oh, how am I going to build that? You can just go and get it from, from, from that page, so it's like pre-packaged operator for you. Or indeed, if, you're, if, if, if something's obviously not there because it's something in-house that's only relevant to you or your enterprise, it's still a great place to go because it kind of shows you how these things were built. And so like anything, when you've got like a template to work from or an example to work from, it's kind of easier to build it as you go along. OK, that was it, short and sweet. If you've got any questions, I'll take them on the side. Uh, but if not, please fill out the survey, etc. Thank you for your time. <laughs>